Hey guys, did you know that I have a Patreon where you can support me and plus get awesome rewards? Or if you're thinking to yourself, but Julian, I want even more bang for my buck while still supporting you, you can pop over to my Redbubble and check out my awesome store with new designs appearing regularly. But for now, enjoy the video you're about to watch. Alright everyone, you know the drill. This is YouTube, so it's time for a disclaimer. We are about to go into a critical reading of The Cellar, so if this happens to be your favorite book and you cannot stand to see it ripped apart, now it's time to go. Thanks for playing. The rest of you, enjoy the show. <laughs> I've been really, like, finding any excuse not to read this book tonight. Kinshu, I know you want to be on my lap, but you're very pokey. Kinshu loves to sit on my lap, but she also has very sharp claws. And the pajama pants I'm wearing tonight are thin. So I'm going to try not to get stabbed by my own cat. I've been trying to find any excuse not to read this book tonight. I probably should read multiple chapters, and... Yeah, I just... it's just so boring. I don't even know how people were interested enough to read it like every week or whenever new chapters came out back when it was on Wattpad. And we're with Clover again, so maybe something interesting will happen. He's the most interesting one, but he, that's not saying very much. I have some chocolate. Fun fact, I really, really like these really fucking cheap chocolate-covered cherries. I love them. And they've got like 10 in a package, so it's not very cost effective, but they're the crappy cheap ones, so who cares? By the way, if you're wondering what the obnoxious yellow shirt is, it's my work uniform. We are in July. When the last time that we saw Clover, he was kidnapping the new Violet in March, and now it's July, and his Violet is completely Stockholm Syndrome. She is completely on board with being his family member, his slave woman in his basement and he's also kidnapped another girl the first poppy and violet is helping her acclimate and he's about to bring in another girl i, I don't know if that's fast I don't, it feels fast for a girl to go completely you know docile but then again she did just like fucking faint to make it the easiest kidnapping ever so maybe he just lucked out with this particular violet and she is like the easiest prisoner the best prisoner, the best slave that he could ever have. She was just waiting for a man to kidnap her and make her live in a cellar. We're finding the origin of the knitting. This is just, this is a riveting reading material, especially in a book that I think is supposed to be like a thriller. We're finding out that the very first Violet loved to knit and that's probably why the other girls all knit now. Thank goodness we found that out. That was just pivotal to the story. These two pages are just Clover and Violet having basically meaningless conversation. Here's another little thing that I like to point out for us authors. I nodded my head. You don't need to say I nodded my head. You can just say I nodded because human beings don't usually nod with anything else except their head. So with my head is implied. So he's picked up a prostitute to murder and she, uh, she goes back with him to his house and he, she says, she says, we're at your place? Yes, I replied, I have a room. She giggled. Sounds kinky. Sounds kinky, really, that he has a bedroom? Bedrooms are so kinky, am I right? Like, not even like a special sex bedroom, just, I have a room. That's kinky. Usually I have sex in the outdoors, so a room, ho ho ho. I'm hoping that the uh, these aren't the author's thoughts. I mean, it is the villain saying these things, so I'm gonna go ahead. Kinshu, do you have to do that right now? Yeah? I'm gonna go ahead and assume that because the bad guy is saying them, these aren't the author's thoughts, but it's still really hard to read just this guy just going off in his head about this woman 
the sex worker and just like how terrible she is and how she lost her morals and wondered what age she turned into a whore. Teenage girls are making little tarts out of themselves and I just, I really, really strongly hope that the author does not feel this way about sex workers. Also, this prostitute is just really dumb. She's like, oh, you want to take me into your basement? Okay, you must have a sex dungeon down there. It's like, girl, do you have no sense of danger? I think you would if you got, we're going to get anywhere with sex work. So he kills her with a pen knife to the gut, and she's dead immediately. And I thought when he pulled the pen knife out, and it does say it's a pen knife, when he pulls it out, I was like, okay, he's gonna slit her throat or something. But no, he stabs her in the stomach, and she just slumps to the floor immediately dead. That's not accurate. If you get stabbed in the stomach, unless it's like a really good, a real good stab, you're not dead right away. Oh, no, 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 no. You get to suffer for a while, and possibly you even live. What kind of self-respecting author doesn't do their research about murder, huh? Huh? What kind of world are we living in? We love to research murder. That's what we live for. So because I want to, I did a little research on murder because it's just fun. If you hear any weird noises in the background, Avi is running around. I did a little research in a book that I have called Body Trauma, A Writer's Guide to Wounds and Injuries. And I also did some research on a site called Quora, which seems like a, uh, it might be intended for that, a perfect site for authors because some of the things that you can also look at are how long does it take to die after being stabbed? And how long does it take blood to clot from a wound? And how long does it take a gun wound on the leg to heal? All sorts of useful author things. Anyway, both my book and this website, which I will link below, agree that you really don't die immediately from being stabbed in the abdomen. The biggest dangers are the inferior vena cava and the abdominal aorta, both of which are closer to the spine, so he would have to stab her with that little bitty pen knife all the way through her abdomen to the spine to damage one of these, at which case it would cause her to bleed to death, which can take minutes, so she's not just dropping immediately dead to the floor. It is also possible to nick one of those, and it takes you even longer to bleed to death. The only other real danger is the bowels, but uh, the bowels are slippery and a knife often will not penetrate the bowel, it will instead slip in between the organs. A bullet will often penetrate the bowel, but not a knife. So in reality, all of this stabbing in the stomach that our villain is doing is the most useless way to kill people. And I just think that this guy has like some sort of perk. He's taken some sort of perk or taken some sort of special skill points in murder women because he just has perfect uh, dice rolls every time for killing people. And it's just not fair, man. It's just not fair. <laughs> his, his violet says, but, but Clover, Clover, it's wrong. Like, don't do that, you naughty boy. It's wrong to kill prostitutes. So, he has body bags in the cupboard under the stairs, and he says he bought more since mother died. So I can only imagine that he and his mother were like this prostitute killing vigilante duo, which honestly, I don't know, I might read that. If, I, I would read it as like a short story or something about a mother and son who just go around murdering together. And then he kidnaps two more women to be his next Rose and the other one, Lily. And that's the end of that chapter, so I guess we'll get on to chapter 15. We are like halfway through this book at this point, so we're making progress, but this book could be a whole lot shorter. It should either be a whole lot shorter or it should have a whole lot more going on in it. There is so much that you could do with this premise, so much, and the author is doing none of it. It's very disappointing. She's not even doing it badly. She's not doing it at all. So. It's December now, where it was summer. And it's December. And it, she says it's been five months she, since she was kidnapped. Five fucking months of her doing jack shit. It's been five fucking months and she's having this conversation with Poppy where she's like, Poppy, do you ever give up? Like, 
And she's thinking in her head, like, I'll never get out of here unless the other girls support me. And it's like, it's been five months, bitch! Five months in which you did jack shit! You learned how to fucking knit! No, no, you don't get to escape anymore. No. You had your chance. I'm sorry. You live in the cellar now. Okay. She does say that he hasn't raped her yet because it takes him six to eight months to fall in love. He's very specific with how long it takes before he starts raping them. I guess it's good that you know how long it takes you to fall in love. You know what would be really fucking interesting? Instead of watching our main character just like cry and fail to escape all the time, if we got... That would be if we got to know these other girls. Like, they're both homeless. Why are they homeless? She's talking to Poppy, and Poppy's like saying how her family wouldn't look for her because they had a giant falling out and they told her to like leave and never come back. And wouldn't it be really fucking interesting to figure out what this seemingly nice girl did to get so aggressively kicked out by her family? Like, that would be really interesting if we could get to know these people. Instead, we get Summer being like, don't worry, my boyfriend will find me. I'm sure that makes Poppy feel great. But we are going to get some from, something from Poppy. Cool, cool, cool. She does mention that nobody has ever asked her about it before, and it took Summer, like, five months to do so. But we are going to have a little talk with Poppy and find out a little bit more about her. Nice of the author to finally do that. So, okay. So, of course, Poppy is, like, still hyper-innocent, and she didn't do anything all that bad. She got in with a bad crowd that took her to, like, raves and stuff, but she only drank a little bit and didn't really do any of the bad things that the other people were doing. But her parents didn't like it, so they kicked her out. So, basically, the worst she did was, like, sneak out of the house and hang out with people who were drinking and doing drugs, even though she didn't do any of it. I don't know. I don't feel like that's the kind of offense that gets your parents to say leave and don't ever come back and we will not even look for you. Maybe that's just me and maybe my parents were exceptional, but I don't think that they would have said that. So he like fucking teleports. They hear the door open as they're setting up breakfast and then all of a sudden he's right behind Summer touching her back and she knows it's him from his aftershave. So he just, he just like teleported from the top of the stairs to right behind her. Maybe that's why they're afraid of him. He has magical powers. She's like, how much longer could I manage to keep away from the psycho? I don't know, Summer. I don't know. You could keep away from him permanently if you would try to escape at all in the five months you've been here. I don't understand why Clover doesn't understand why, that flowers wilt, that flowers and vases wilt, because he loses his shit every single time the flowers in the vases on the table wilt, so he has to replace them. How, how, how does he, like, I understand that he's a crazy person, but how does he not understand that flowers wilt? He's always like, what happened? What happened to the flowers? I don't know, fucker. What happened to the flowers? Guys, I'm in a mood tonight, you can tell. We are having the exact same mental conversation. It might even be copy-pasted. Our main character is watching him freak out, and she's having the exact same thoughts the, as the last time he freaked out, which was like five months ago that we, that we saw that. I'm sure he's freaked out multiple times since then. But does she think the same thing every time? It's so similar, I would be very surprised if it wasn't essentially copied and pasted. She compares him being angry to a dog playing with a balloon. So, pro tip, if you want to set a scary image, probably don't compare it to an adorable animal playing. So now he's hitting all of them across the face for the flowers dying, and our main character, he pins her against the wall so he can, like, beat her, and she's thinking about her boyfriend in her head, wishing that he would come save her. So, her getting smacked around makes her less determined to escape. Now, on the one hand, I guess I can kind of understand it, because, like, if he beats you enough, you're afraid to escape because you think he's just going to beat you more. But, I don't know. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make you want to escape, like, this guy who beats you? It's not like an abused wife situation where, like, sometimes you, you love him. Because they don't love him. He's an asshole who murders people. So wouldn't you, this only motivate you more to want to escape, not make you less motivated to leave? I don't know. I've never been kidnapped and locked in the cellar, so I don't know. 
Well, never mind. Our character oscillates so fucking bad between I give up, I have to just play along, and I need to escape. And so she was just thinking to herself, he's so violent, I don't want to try to escape because he's just going to hurt me. And like that, she just switches. And now she's yelling at the other two for not wanting to escape. Like, this is not characterization. Pick a lane. Now, you can have your character start out one way at the beginning of the book and go towards the other. Like, it would be a strong story if our character was passive, but she learned to be strong. As things kept happening to her, it kept building up and building up until she decided, no, fuck this, I'm getting myself out of here. That is character growth. But this is not. This is a character who cannot decide how to be. This is a character who, in the same chapter, goes back and forth like three times between being utterly determined to escape and ashamed of the others for not doing it, and completely submissive and ready to just go along with this forever. Something that a uh, uh, review that I looked at pointed out, and I'm not looking at any spoilery reviews, but every now and then I need a little encouragement to keep going. So I look at some reviews, and one of them mentioned that the only reason that the girls don't try anything is because we are told, not shown, that like somebody tried it before and it failed. Now we are kind of shown when, <clears throat> when Violet tries it, but she tries it so poorly that you just know that if the girls actually came up with a good plan, that they would be able to escape. Even the character acknowledges that she can't make up her damn mind. She says, uh, two minutes ago, this was impossible and now I was rallying the troops. Yep, it's almost like your character doesn't really have a character. So this is not a strong way to show a character behaving a certain way. Clover has come back, and he's brought them flowers, but he's acting really nervous and edgy. And the author occasionally puts in a sentence about how he's actually acting, but more, considerably more sentences are devoted to questions by the character that don't help. The scene, in fact, they get kind of frustrating. So, like, his eyes darted around the room every few seconds, flicking back to the door. Okay, that tells us he's nervous. But then she's like, who was he expecting? The police? He was acting weirder than before. Was it best to ignore him completely? And she just keeps asking these pointless questions when we could just be kind of observing this character and making our own thoughts for ourselves. Like, you don't need to keep asking these questions with the character. You can give the character thoughts that aren't questions, that's one, and two, just let us watch this guy for a while and make questions of our own. And that's the end of that chapter. Boy, I, I really hated that chapter, as was evidenced by all of my sass. It's just a holding pattern with a character who just keeps going around and around but never growing or making choices. She just does things, and her thoughts are so repetitive. I mean, I hope that this is helping us learn some things, some writing things, but boy, this is, this is pretty bad, guys. This is worse than I thought it was going to be, actually. It's very amateur, and I really hope that the author has come a lot further in her writing career and gotten a lot better, because this is very bad. Hey, welcome back. About to read chapter 16 from Clover's point of view again. I'm here on a Saturday in essentially my pajamas. I've got grown up candy this time, some bark thins, and also some Lindor truffles. So you know that this is serious. This book is making me miss The Savior's Champion because while The Savior's Champion had boring moments, it also had lots of nonsense to keep my interest up. This is nothing! So we got Clover and he's sitting with his uh, latest acquisitions of girls and he feels that the table's unbalanced because there are supposed to be four girls and he only has three and it makes me wonder why did he choose four? Do we ever find out or was it just like four was the arbitrary number that he chose? Might be something interesting to find out. So apparently Clover has a crush on a girl named Shannon who he wants to make his new rose and he thinks that she's his chance at a normal relationship. I don't know what his idea of a normal relationship is, but he still wants to make her a rose, so that's... So he's gone to see Shannon, this girl that he wants to make his new rose, and she's living in a hostel, and he like just drives there and then like finds her outside and just walks up to her and he's like, hello again. 
as though they had not planned to meet, and she does not find it at all fucking creepy that he just showed up where she lives and is like, hey, let's go into the trees together and hang out. That's not creepy at all. It's not stalkery. No red flags from any of these women. So he starts out holding her hand because they're going to go for a walk, and then later he takes her hand again. That's something, again, to watch out for with, like, repetitive things in your writing. Pay attention to if you have characters holding each other's hands or that kind of thing so you don't accidentally have them do it again a few paragraphs later. That's something that you can often catch in editing. It's just something to be on the lookout for. I was getting this hint earlier on, but we now we have it, like, very explicitly on the page. Colin's father slept with a prostitute, which is what tore their family apart, and probably why Colin kills prostitutes. Possibly he did so with his mother as a mother-son prostitute murdering duo, which as I mentioned, I would read that book because that sounds fucking entertaining, if terrible. I'm sure Colin has lots of other mental illness stuff going on, but I guess his trigger, I guess you could say, was that his father slept with a prostitute and tore their family apart. Damn it, Dad, didn't you know that this would turn me into a murder hobo who just, like, kills women and imprisons them in my basement? Parents can be so thoughtless. I am curious, because Colin is mad at Shannon's father because he did not take care of his wife and daughter, and Colin is like, a man should take care of his family, which makes me ask, how much money is Colin making, and how is he affording... The lavish lifestyle that he gives to four adult women that he is constantly buying them new clothes and just anything that they need, food, and he's bringing them new movies and everything that they need down in their little cellar home. How is he affording it? I'm sure that's never going to be brought up, but that's just a logistical thing I'm very curious about. So he's taking Shannon to his house, which is right down the road from the hostel where she lives, which makes me think that his house is not out in the middle of nowhere. And yet no one has noticed that he frequently brings sometimes unconscious women into his house, not to mention the sheer number of prostitutes that go in and don't come out, at least not in the same condition they went in. So he's obviously kidnapping Shannon at this point, and she's fighting back, she hasn't just fainted. But because she's homeless, she's all skinny and weak and not as strong at fighting back, and that also occurred to me that, like, he takes these girls and he essentially bulks them up, so, like, they could totally physically take him by the time he's done with them. He did, that, that's another thing he hasn't really thought about. He's making them stronger so that they could defeat him. Good thing they're too stupid to try that. And he put uh, his new rose, Shannon, in his lady cellar. Maybe this rose is the rose, f like, in this later timeline. That's a possibility, that uh, the rose that he is in love with is the rose from Summer's timeline. Which, I mean, obviously that's probably the tie-in, and I'm just, like, slow on the uptake there. Oh, we are on to chapter 17, and I was just plowing right through. It's still Clover, but this is now finally present-day Clover, which we have never gotten before. So he's going to the hostel again to pick up a new girl to fill out his girl roster. And it really makes me wonder, like, if he keeps going to the same fucking hostel, again, why has no one noticed? How? I mean, I am unobservant, but I think even I would pick up after years of this guy doing this. Also, he's usually, he seems to stalk them a lot more, he seems to plan it a lot more, he wants them to be homeless. Why did he take Summer? That's not his M.O. at all. Was it just like an impulse thing? Like, um, maybe we'll get that chapter later, but like, his M.O. is to stalk girls for a while, is to take girls that won't be missed. Summer was just walking alone in a park. He has no reason to assume that she would not be missed, that he would not be sought if he took her. I don't understand. Again, these women are all very, very easy for him to get. He finds a girl that he likes, and he's like, hey, do you need a lift? And at first she's like, no, but then he like makes an excuse for why he should give her a lift, and then she just goes along with it. Like, nobody fights him terribly hard at all, and then he finally gets them back to his house and they fight him a little bit, but it always goes super well. He's just been incredibly, incredibly lucky this entire time. Like, I want to see some of his failures in these chapters. I want to see some girls who are like, nah, bitch, and like, run away, or, you know, hit him over the head with something and flee. Like, you get the idea that this isn't a country road. They're not going very fast or anything. So when she realizes that he is 
actively kidnapping her. He has not pulled out a gun. He has not pulled out a knife. Like, turn in your seat and kick him in his fucking head as hard as you can. Is what I'm saying here, woman. Don't just sit there and be like, oh, guess he got me. So he's kidnapped another Violet and shoved her down into the room, and it's just the same. It's the same. He takes Lily, at the end of this, Lily being Summer, he takes her to his rape room, which she just goes right into, even though this is the thing that she has been 100% fearing the most this entire time. She just went into the rape room, willingly. Now, I think we're about to get Summer's point of view again, and, you know, it'll explain how she, like, froze up or whatever. Remember that this is a fictional character? And I can shame a fictional character if I want to, and I just, I'm not impressed. Again, I'm not impressed with Summer. We're not actually forced to watch the rape, which I'm okay with. I don't like those kind of scenes in books. So we're just the aftermath where she's, like, feeling all terrible and, and in her own bed and crying. By the way, is he slipping them birth control? How, like, he rapes these girls fairly regularly, how are none of them pregnant? He must be, like, feeding them birth control secretly somehow, or pumps it into the air vents, or I don't know, something. Hand wave nonsense. So now she's berating herself for not fighting, but she never really says why she didn't fight. He was like, come here, go, come into my rape room, and she was like, okay, and she went right in. So she segues in her head, she's laying in her bed now, and she is, you know, every time she closes her eyes, she sees Clover's face looming over her, but she decides to picture Lewis instead. So we have segued from thinking about her rapist to how happy her boyfriend makes her. I don't know if that's a terribly realistic segue. Maybe that's just me. I don't think that that's what my brain would do. And of course then she goes to, oh, now I'm all dirty and how would Lewis ever love me again after this? Okay, now we're gonna get a flashback, I think, to that her and her boyfriend, like, coming together. I think, uh, I see the word sex further down the page, so I think it's gonna be them having sex for the first time. Which we should, it's definitely the, the right thing to read after a rape section. Her and her boyfriend having consensual sex. I don't know why this is here. I mean, I guess I know why it's here. Sex and sex, they go together, so put the two sex chapters next to each other. Ooh, I don't like this line. Uh, Lewis is nervous, and she is kind of like, not. Um, she says, I looked up at him through my eyelashes. What if he had changed his mind? I mentally laughed at myself. What, a 17-year-old guy changed his mind about sex? I know that this is a teenage girl thinking this, but guys can change their mind about sex just as easily as women can, and it's not healthy to think that guys are just like always, always will want to have sex, and even if they're uncomfortable, they're still going to want to have sex. And that's it for that chapter. We just watch her have sex with her boyfriend for the first time. That's what it is. It's not very well described. It's not really anything they can be like, oh, kinky, I'm gonna read a sex scene. It's just sort of a very bland, very straightforward little sex scene. My camera seems to have eaten the last little section of this chapter, which is fine. I just wanted to come on and say and make it clear because I know for a fact that I have viewers that have been sexually assaulted because it's just statistically true. So I just want to make it clear that um, Summer's thoughts brief as they are after she's assaulted, are not the most unrealistic things that I have ever seen. She thinks about, like, she can't get the image of Clover o on top of her out of her head. It's a very natural thing. She worries that her boyfriend won't love her anymore, which is a thought that some victims can have, that they are somehow filthy now, and that their loved ones will no longer like them, and they sort of victim blame themselves. So those are not bad on the author's part. Where I think this this really does stumble, though, is where it goes from a, a character dealing with the fact that she was just assaulted to a character fantasizing about the first time she had sex with her boyfriend. That's where I really think that it stumbles. And I just want to make it clear that I'm not belittling Summer, although she's a fictional character, for the more realistic thoughts that she has after her assault. So I don't want anybody who's been assaulted, please don't come after me. I see you and I apologize if I put my foot in it too much with this chapter. Feel free to let me know in the comments, it's fine, I'll own up to it. But anyway, enjoy the next bit. So I'd rather just sit on my butt 
and read inane Facebook posts than read this inane book. I was thinking about it, like, I, did, I picked this book kind of impulsively because of the Wattpad thing, but I think in future read-alongs I'm going to stick to some books that are a little bit more bonkers. I've got some ideas. Uh, I've heard Zenith is pretty bad, so that would be a fun one for us to take apart. I'm also intrigued by the Handbook for Mortals, so both of those might be on the docket in the future for these read-alongs. Uh, I will not be surprised if this one doesn't do terribly well, because I just feel like this book is so boring. There's nothing bonkers for us to talk about. I miss bonkers. I miss the pig challenge, you guys. By the way, all three of the cats are here. We've got Kinshu, we've got Nigel, and we've got Jane. The whole family is here. The dog is, is down there on her bed next to the couch. The fairy is not here. She is in her cage. But that's okay. We know she's here in spirit. I'm doing a lot of procrastinating. Let's get on to chapter 19. We are back with summer in the present. Let's do this. So far this chapter is really bland. She wakes up, she showers again. We just get essentially a complete repeat of what she did the night before, including her thoughts. They're all the same. Uh, she goes out to the girls and they basically are just uh, sort of telling her how to disassociate while she's being raped. So nothing terribly exciting is happening. One of the girls is telling her about what she thinks about when she disassociates while she's being raped, and she thinks about a very, very stereotypical life that women are supposed to want. She lives in a cottage, and there's a vegetable patch, and her husband is a man who makes lots of money and takes excellent care of her, and she has lots of babies. Now, I'm not saying that can't be a dream that you have, but at the same time, it is the most stereotypical dream that this girl could possibly have and really doesn't inform us any more about her. I think all we're going to get from Poppy as far as character is that little snippet we got about her history, which I've already kind of forgotten because it was so nothing. Oh yeah, she, she went out drinking and her parents decided that that was worth kicking her out of the house forever. Okay, I think this is the second time that the character has finally realized that she could do damage with boiling water, which I have been saying, if you recall, this entire time. Uh, the girls are making tea and she's like, you could do a lot of damage with boiling water, but is she ever going to do anything about it? Probably not. The only thing I can think is, after thinking about it for an entire book, at the very end of the book, she might actually try some of these strategies that she randomly thinks of, but never actually decides to implement. This girl is so random. Poppy is making tea or whatever, and she's like, Lily, do you want any extra sugar? And Summer thinks, why would I want extra sugar? What is, wh why is the sentence even here? Why are you so insulted by her asking if you want extra sugar? What is, why? Why are you like this, Summer? Summer realizes for the first time that she's not the only one who has lost a future by being down in the cellar. So good for her. That's a little personal growth. She will uh, certainly immediately go back to caring about herself and only herself. But for this beautiful paragraph, she realizes that Rose and Poppy might have wanted something different for their lives too. Oh yeah, and there's a new Violet, which we completely forgot about because Summer obviously got sexually assaulted the night before, so I guess it's kind of understandable that we forgot about the new Violet, but like, this girl's also traumatized, uh, and we've only just remembered that she exists. So the other girls are like, oh, this new girl, this new Violet, she won't talk to us, she hasn't said a word. Summer asks her a question and she answers immediately, because Summer is the uh, epitome of the good, kind person who other people would definitely just automatically open up to. So this new Violet um, is the main character that we all are missing because she's like, I'm gonna fucking get out of here, bitches, I'm not staying here. So we'll see if she actually tries to do anything and if our main character helps her. Our, our main character immediately dismisses a bunch of things in her head because like he would see it coming if they tried to hit him with a chair or a frying pan. But like, not if you were stealthy, not if you planned it. So the new Violet's like, okay, tonight I'm just gonna fucking hit him with a frying pan. And our main character's like, no, that's a terrible idea. Too many things could go wrong. We've already tried hitting him once. We can never try that again. And do it better this time. Why are these girls so dumb? So new Violet 
Even though she said she was going to hit him with a frying pan, instead she hits him with the vase. The exact same thing old Violet tried to hit him with, and the vases are flimsy and they don't work as a weapon. Why did both of these girls try to use a fucking vase when there are frying pans right there? Dinner has just been prepared. She could easily have access to a frying pan. Why? She could have earlier gone and got like a rolling pin and hidden it or had it behind her back or something, but no. They always reach for the stupid vase which does nothing and now she's gonna get killed. And of course no one's gonna help Violet, they're just gonna watch because again, they're all too afraid of Clover. Like bitches, fight the fuck back. I am so done with all of these girls at this point, so done. We're on to chapter 20 and I am done. Summer. Summer, honey, honey, oh honey. Summer is like, okay, maybe I'll help. And what does she reach for as a weapon? Can you guess? If you guessed another one of the useless flimsy vases, you are correct. Oh, Summer. I would say never change, but please, please change because you're insufferable and this is so in character for her, though. Oh, Poppy stops her, so she doesn't even get to use the stupid flimsy vase. And then her main character's like, Oh, no, I'm too sad, and she just collapses to the floor. Wow, she's a real fucking hero coming to the rescue of this other girl. Clearly, Clover's back is, like, to them, because he's beating up this other girl. So, like, hit him. Violet has stopped fighting as well. Like, she hit him with the vase, and, like, he slapped her, and now she's just stopped fighting. She's like, well, the base didn't work. I guess there's no chance. What is wrong with these girls? And our main character's just like, oh, I didn't want to watch him kill another girl. It never got any easier to watch. Then do something! These characters are so passive. Like, I, I fully admit that I don't like passive characters in a book. That's a preference, but geez, these, I have not met in a long time characters as passive as these characters. Yeah, Violet's death here is really kind of Summer's fault and Poppy's fault because they are just sitting there watching. They're, it's like it's a TV show and they're just sitting there watching and being like, there's nothing we can do. You are surrounded by kitchen implements. Surrounded. Just grab two and start wailing on him as hard as you can, while he is distracted beating up this other girl. But no, 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 they just sit there like, oh gosh, this is so horrible, I hate it when he kills people. Nothing we can do. If I was Violet, I would be like, as I'm being beaten to death, I would be so mad as I look across at these girls who are literally just watching me be beaten to death, unhelpfully looking sad. So he didn't actually kill Violet. Even better, so Violet can be really salty. If I was Violet, I would be so salty. I would be like, why did you just sit there and watch me get beaten within an inch of my life? You cunts. Jane is in my shot, because he's like, Mommy, don't use that language. Like, as they're trying to take care of this girl who's been beaten within an inch of her life, Summer's like, I was utterly terrified she would die. She was my only chance. Summer, this is not about you, you deplorable bitch. So they lay new Violet in her bed, and she's all sad and miserable because she just got beaten with an inch of her life, and she's like, am I going to die? And my, like, those, those would not be my first words to these people. Uh, my first words to these people would be, you utter assholes. Why didn't you help me? And Summer sits down on the side of her bed and is like comforting her, and she says, you're going to be fine, we'll look after you, and then she thinks, that bastard wasn't going to get his way. I would do everything I could to make sure she was okay. Yeah, you were really doing everything you could while you were sitting there watching her get beaten. Summer is like, Summer, before I kind of thought she was adorable, in, uh, but now I think that she is just the worst. You were there, she just watched a girl get beaten in front of her and was like, oh no, how could this happen? And then she's like, how does this affect me? Once again, our main character waffles drastically back and forth between I'm going to die down here and I need to escape. Violet's the only one who understands how much I need to escape. I am kind of surprised that Clover gets this pissed off. If one of the girls just like attacks him with a crappy plastic vase. Like, 
This must, he kidnaps a lot of girls. This must happen every now and then. He must know that if he wants to keep any girls, he has to not just, like, murder them. Or maybe he does murder them, and he just gets more from his endless supply of homeless women that he just has. You know, and he only keeps the ones who don't try to hit him with a plastic vase. I don't know. So since, uh, since Clover decided not to kill New Violet, he's just killing a prostitute in the next room instead, just to get his kill boner dealt with. At least this poor prostitute doesn't have to look at a bunch of women just sitting there not helping her. At least there's that. That's the end of chapter 20. The next chapter is going to be from Clover's point of view. So we'll see how that's going on, but I'm going to wait to read that because like two chapters tonight was enough. Oh my gosh, I hate Summer so much now. I hate her. Aggressively. Uh, comment below and let me know if you hate Summer, or if you feel like it was realistic that she just sat there and watched another girl get bludgeoned to death. You know, don't comment if it was realistic. Nothing in this book is realistic. But, but comment below anyway, because commenting about stuff is fun. Anyway, myself and all of my cats bid you adieu. Hey everybody, it is shout out time again. Time to shout out to my patrons, Amanda, Ashley, Celia, Kim, Lisa, Ramona, Sabby Panda, and Sarah. And if you want to be great like these amazing people, then become my patron over on Patreon.